Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do a companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net if you have suggestions for topics guests and other ideas please send them to info@scientificsense.com and i can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Krishnanand Marachurubo, who is a professor of civil engineering and construction at Bradley University. His teaching interests include various areas of civil and environmental engineering, sustainability, ethics, and public policy. In addition to more than 50 publications in international journals and conferences, Krishna has co-authored three book chapters in the field of environmental engineering. Welcome, Krishna. Uh, thank you, Vil. It's uh, great to be here. It's, uh, and it's also wonderful to touch base with you after such a long time. Yes. Uh, very happy to be on this program. Yeah, absolutely. I want to start with uh, one of your papers. Uh, it's entitled uh, Rejuvenation of Rivers and Lakes in India, Balancing Social Priorities with Technological Possibilities in which uh, you say in the light of shortage of water in several parts of the world especially in the developing country like india and in the context of prevailing policy of accelerating growth through industrialization there is an imminent need for devising newer approaches of water management you want to talk a bit about that paper yeah sure um the context of this paper was that uh, i took a sabbatical of that year uh, 2011 and uh, i spent that with uh, one of my colleagues uh, who i also who also did uh, his phd at the same time with me yeah uh, his name is shama soleka so the, so we did this uh, uh, project uh, so so the, the sabbatical was in iit bombay right and uh, and 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 the and essentially what happened there was when i got there we were working on a number of different uh, projects and things like that but this became uh, this started to be one of the uh, one of the emerging things and sham has been working on on similar related t- type of topics for a while but uh, we felt like uh, you know that was a time that uh, the ganga there was something called the ganga action plan in india and uh, that was also uh, Uh, going into a new stage and there was also something called the yamuna action plan and the, there was a there was some concern about how uh, how the management practices were happening there and how the technology there was a technology gap and then there was also a difference in in terms of how the um, how it was being applied in different uh, parts of the country at that time so we said why don't we look at the whole thing and not just look at it just purely from a water distribution standpoint or a water availability but just look at the whole thing because uh let's face it you know in our world we're all we live in a connected world like i don't live you know uh, apart from somebody else or separate from somebody else i'm connected with other human beings yeah and what happens around the environment affects me and i as i affect the environment Uh, both from a uh, from a complete so sus- uh, so sustainability standpoint in the sense that not only the environment but the economics also plays a, a big role into it and then you cannot uh, uh neglect the social side of it because if you do that that's again to the detriment of any solution that you might be producing there 
So right. that was the context of this uh, of the paper, and then we we were invited by uh, Elsevier uh, to uh, to write this paper, and initially we had started out and we started to look at the data. We looked at the data from different parts of uh, India, and then slowly it actually grew into. We also looked at other parts of the world too, and it was a stunning thing. What we found was that. Uh, out of all of the um, um, naturally occurring uh, water resources that we were uh, we 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 got data on, yeah, you could there was not even one uh, of them what was uh, we, what we what we could call pristine or something which was uh, free of any pollutants. Right. And that, that that was uh, you know even though we suspected this, but just to find that out uh, and 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 uh, uh, with something of a. Eye opener, and then we said, "How do we connect this?" I mean, so how these do... samples, Krishna, one quick thing. So these samples are coming from any water body or just rivers? Uh, no, from different. Uh, so some of them are from rivers. So yeah. and again, this is not just the data that we collected. This is data that is coming from, uh, say, you know, uh, India has something called the CPCB, which is called the, uh, which is the equivalent of EPA, US EPA here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so they manage all of those data resources. So we got a lot of data from them, and we got a lot of data from other parts of the country too, and 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 the world. But they are they they coming. They came from rivers. Yeah. Uh, they came from lakes, and also from groundwater. So I mean, those are the three primary sources uh, with you know where we draw water from. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so. Um... So, uh, you know, did you have any sort of uh, time-based data uh, to look at how water quality has changed over time? Yeah, we, we did have, uh, we, we do have that. And uh, uh, the historical data goes back, you know, uh, at least a couple of decades, even more than that in some, some places. Yeah. But, you know, when you look at data sets like this, you have to also appreciate the fact that uh, people are not collecting the data in the same way, so there's going to be differences mm -hmm. in how they collect the data, et cetera. But right. despite that, we, we saw these uh, trends about, you know, and uh, typically we would say we have two two or three, if I just give you maybe parameters, which uh, yeah. commonly anybody can relate to. One is called the BOD or a bio, what's called biochemical oxygen demand, and that's really a measure of how polluted uh, a river or any water resources is, is uh, in terms of the organic material. Yeah. So the more the organic material in general, or in more the waste are there, the higher the BOD generally. Mm -hmm. And there's another another uh, measure called COD, chemical oxygen demand, and it measures a similar thing, except it goes beyond what is biologically biodegradable, and it also looks at uh, possibly other types of sources such as industrial pollution sources and such. So the waste that was just coming into these different uh, areas was not just uh, human waste, but it was also coming from other types of things. So that's one. Yeah. Uh, the uh, BOD and COD, I can say, put together is one. Then you can think about things like the microbiological quality, which is more of the water side or, or the or safety in terms of the drinking. Mm -hmm. So again, that's again a very, uh, very significant thing. Um, so, you know, we had data on that also from different parts of the, uh, from, from different sources. And so we kind of looked at all of that in a, in a, in a more complete sense. And even more uh, important is that, uh, you know, what we also found that when we dug deep into some of these uh, case studies and we found our, or in, actually they were not case studies at the time, they were just information pieces yeah. in different places. We, we, we actually discovered how, uh, how the process of the waste was actually, you know, how, how the waste was contaminating these water resources. Mm -hmm. And um, surprisingly, some of that could be managed effectively. I mean, it was as simple as managing things properly. In some cases, of course, the technology was needed. But the availability of drinking safe, clean drinking water was really a big, big issue. And that is really probably the fundamental reason why there is so much... Uh, uh, disease uh, and uh, so many problems and not just in India but in much of the world where we are looking at uh, uh, the rate of development being so fast but then we don't have the infrastructure to catch up with it. Yeah so the, these natural water sources Krishna they, they, they are not portable water right you, you have to treat them before you can use it right? No we, uh, no these we were looking actually at the um, 
we, we've looked at both of them. So, yeah. for example, when you when you look at lakes and rivers or groundwater, yeah. those are definitely potable water. Okay. So, so these are drinking water supplies that people actually use. But you know what we found was that, and and I think it's now very well documented anywhere, everywhere else, is that uh, you know when you have a chain of, for example, if you take a river or a stream, let's say let's take a river, and you have so many villages and so many towns, and if they grow uh, to a very, if they are small enough, the waste is manageable. But then if the waste is very high, yeah, which means the population is higher, the industries are there, they discharge all this water sequentially so what happens is that you know uh, suppose i live downstream from some other uh, from another big town or big village or big city and then somebody else lives down uh, downstream of me the person who's downstream of me gets the effect of the bod and the pod the cod and the other pollution that's coming from the first source second source and, and third source so as a result it all adds up and the cumulative, uh, you know, mul- uh, effect is the, it's it's actually a synergy in the wrong way, and right. so essentially yeah. it, it just uh, and in some places it just kills the river, which means that the oxygen levels actually fall to zero, mm. which literally kill the river. There's no fish, nothing. Okay, so mm. that that's one of the problems there. And and the people who live downstream, they yeah. don't have any other water supply. They still use that same water, and the, right. and the shocking thing is that they don't even have. Uh, basic uh, water treatment type of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, technologies with, with which they can purify that. So essentially, they are drinking the the waste that has been uh, generated by somebody else. I mean, in a very raw sense, but then you're looking at it over a stretch of maybe 20, 30, 50, 100 miles. Right. Yeah. So you know, one of the things you focused on the paper is balancing societal priorities with uh, with available technologies. Um, I, I don't I don't know exactly if you discussed this in the paper, but from an economic perspective, Krishna, this is sort of upstream users. Uh, you know, um, it sounds to me that they're externalizing costs. So there has to be some sort of an economic transfer from upstream users to downstream users from a from a policy perspective, right? I don't know how it works. No, I think that when you use that word externalizing the cost. Yeah. That was that is you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what is happening. In fact, it's not just happening in the water sector in India, but it's also happening in the solid waste. Very recently, last year also, I went uh, and I did another sabbatical. This time it was at both uh, Bombay and, and NIT Madras. And we had similar type of thing, but except we were focusing more on the solid waste problem. Yeah. But the externalization of the cost, especially in, in the sense of that water uh, example that we would, that we are discussing is very critical because... Uh, you know, if if you look in most of the homes, even they say, well, you know, my home is very clean and you go inside, it's maybe a small hut is my small, whatever it is. It's very clean inside. But then just when you, where did the waste go? They just went outside. Mm-hmm. So it's right out there. Now, what happens is that, uh, you know, if the, if the uh, waste is not managed properly, what they're doing is that, that, and if the population size is high enough, even the municipal waste itself could uh, be could wash away because of of rains, etc., and then drain into these rivers and lakes. Uh, so that that causes the problem. So certainly they're externalizing the cost. Yeah. So then you then you say, well, how do you actually deal with this type of a problem, right? So uh, my friend Sham Asolaker, who's been doing this work also for a long time, is uh, done a fair amount of good work in this in India. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the work that uh, uh, is, it's like this, that you ca- you cannot have that social prioritization and, and, the, and balance the economic, uh, all of that stuff. You can't do that unless you actually address the problem on the ground in that village, et cetera. So, for example, let us say that uh, some waste is being generated. So if the waste is allowed to go directly into the stream, you know, you it's a waste that has been externalized, but it also causes a problem, health problem. And that has an, its own uh, societal effects and it also has its own economic effects because obviously healthcare costs and various things like that. But yeah. now, if you are able to manage that waste waste within that, uh, within that village or within that sector, one of the things that happens, is, well, how do you do that is the next question. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you, if you do that, then you know you're ahead of the game. So how do you do that? So yeah. there's some examples of that in this uh, paper. So one example is uh, 
you know, when the water comes out, the wastewater comes out, instead of just pushing it away into something, into a lake or, or, or a river, you yeah. take that and then, uh, for example, you can create a, a small pond. And this is where the technology comes in. Now, remember that when we talk about the technology, there's a phrase I'm going to use called appropriate technologies. Right, yeah. This appropriate technology is a, is a very critical phrase because um, we cannot use a highly mechanized technology in a place which doesn't have the infrastructure to support it. You need power too. Yeah. And, yeah. and unfortunately, I mean, some of the projects that I've seen when I, when I was in India and also outside mm -hmm. is that uh, a lot of the funding that goes to these projects, you know, people are, are always, you know, IMF and other agencies, et cetera. They, they pump this money into these areas. But then one of the things that happens is that the people who buy these technologies, they buy it with the hope that it'll actually last for a long time, mm -hmm. but it cannot because the, the, there's no parts to replace it there. The manpower to run it is not there. So the appropriate technology means necessarily that the technology has to be low cost uh, in a yeah. place like that. And by the way, it's not just local to or it's not just uh, native to India or other, other developing countries. We can use that in highly developed uh, countries, uh, including the United States, especially in the rural areas where you're dealing with similar types of economic uh, issues. So here, you know, when you create uh, with these small, uh, with these, uh, for example, oxidation ponds followed by trickling filters, et cetera. And the, the, these are the, some of the case studies, you know, and the input the, in terms of the power input, in terms of the pumping, all of that, co those costs are very, very minimal. So most yeah. of it, the flows by gravity. So the nature will take care of it. I mean, one of the biggest mm -hmm. friends uh, for us is the nature. Now, if we over pollute something, you overwhelm nature. That's something we don't want. But if you give enough time, you can actually convert that uh, the waste into, you know, it gets converted into CO2, et cetera. But then what flows out is essentially effluent, which is not so bad. And then you can run it through some kind of a sand filter, which is again, very uh, cheap technology. And then what, and once you do that, then you can actually put it into the, into a pond and that pond is treated uh, wastewater, which is very good. In fact, a lot of times that treated wastewater is as good of a quality as you might find in many rivers and streams. And in that pond, for example, uh, in some of these case studies that you, see, you might see, uh, people can use that for um, growing fish, you know, other types of uh, thing. So, uh, so it can actually serve as a, as a place where they can grow these things and then they can either utilize that or they can sell it off. So yeah. the stigma of using the wastewater is gone because you, you, you have cleaned the wastewater now. So therefore you're dealing with water. Now, even after that, the next step, because you have a continuous uh, supply, so that, that water which comes out then, then can actually be used for farming. And instead of just throwing it away um, or you know, letting it uh, go into the ground without being treated. So, um, so, it, it, so all along this chain, what you've done is use the appropriate technologies, mm -hmm. and the, which means that the people on the ground have the, te the, man, the, the manpower is there and they have the know-how to run this because it's not a, so complicated and it does is not so mechanized. That's one very important thing. The other thing is that you are buying in into the you're you're having a buy-in from the community in the sense that you're creating a resource for them. And yeah. one of the resources, I mean, one is the the water, clean water that comes out. And the second thing is things like these fish ponds and such, which can actually generate revenue for them. So it's so you're really doing that. And and wherever those types of operations have happened. And this necessarily has to be decentralized or in a small scale. So what was being externalized as a problem, now if you if you manage it in a in a proper way, you actually create a resource out of it and it, it becomes beneficial to them. So right. As long as there is buy-in from the people, you know, then you you actually have a very uh, productive uh, uh, you know um, uh, process by which you convert something which was a waste into a very useful resource. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. So so when you say decentralized and small scale, one thing I I was wondering uh, was that if it is you know kind of self sufficient and autonomous, uh, perhaps uh, you solar power. Uh, doesn't require, you know, a um, lot of external manual 
uh, feedbacks to it. Um, you can, and, and if it is distributed and, and small scale, uh, you could probably go to places all around the, uh, all around the river and, and have these types of units. I'm just uh, speculating. Oh, yeah, no, it's absolutely, it's a fantastic idea. And it, it has to be managed and designed and, you know, delivered properly, also executed properly, because anything of this type requires a certain vision and then also skillful execution. Those are the two things that kind of go together with a project like this. But if you look at a country like India, you know, solar power is there, right? I mean, this is a place where you find a lot of sun. And not only when you talk about India, but also other places on the planet where, which enjoy that type of a climate. And so, therefore, it's, uh, it makes perfect sense to use them as power sources. For example, if you have to run pumps or if you have to run other kinds of – and they may, they may not be very high-powered pumps. I mean, these may be low, uh, you know, in terms of the, the input of power that's needed. They may be lower. So you can certainly do that, and that's a, that's a very effective way of, of doing this. That's a, you know, these are, these are the kinds of – uh, I would say that would be an example of an appropriate technology, which is where it, which can be integrated into this uh, waste management system. Yeah. 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 You touched on this already. Another paper that's related uh, entitled Reusing Fractions of Legacy Municipal Solid Waste in India, a Circular Economy Approach. So, so these are um, um, legacy waste or aged waste and and then basically again the the issue is the same right the sites are often uh on locations where fresh uh, waters are not brought uh, because the sites are fully packed and inoperable you say so the problem appears to be uh, very similar yeah so th this work actually goes back to maybe 2015-16 and then we, i think this paper is uh, probably just came out um, and this was also work that I did with uh, my colleagues in India. And uh, one of the projects that uh, they were doing at the time was uh, with actual landfills in India. There's a, there, there are a few landfills. I mean, this came out at the time, there was suddenly an urgency in 2016 when one of the landfills in Mumbai, uh, I think the Devanar one, it got, caught fire. And, it, and you could see it in some of the NASA pictures. I mean, you could see it. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, you know, there was similarly the, the issue, then the problem said, then the people got awoke to this issue and they said, well, let's take a look at a few others around the country. Yeah. But then when you look at it, you, you have so many hazardous waste landfills. This was an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. These are designed landfills, but there's no municipal waste landfills as such. I mean, at that time, it's, mm. it's changing slowly in India. But then the question becomes when you have these dumps, and these are very common. In fact, I remember some of them, them when I was growing up, even in Chennai, if you go to certain parts of the the, the, the country or the, or the city, you would see these dumps. Yeah. Uh, and they grow and they grow and they grow. And, uh, you know, they just, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's first of all, it's an eyesore. The second thing is, biggest thing, bigger problem is it's a health hazard. And then the third thing is that, you know, you can actually have a lot of uh, uh, pollution that comes off of it without, uh, when people really don't think about, for example, you could have runoff, you could have the air pollution part of it, even without something burning. So you have many other issues also, and not only that, economically, it will bring down the price of the neighborhood, et cetera. So those, those are all the issues there. So how do you deal with a problem like that? So this was a very interesting approach, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, and we we did uh, the, we we did some work here in in, in this country, and also in uh, there was a paper in Chicago, also an ASC paper on that. But then yeah. we also came and visited uh, the landfills around this area to get a good handle on what 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 are the best solutions to this. So one way to deal with this type of a solid waste problem is to see if you can go to a zero net production. So in other words, what you're doing is that. You, if you have a, and, and with legacy wastes, uh, this, that term itself was coined by us, uh, you know, by Sham a while ago, just not recently. Yeah. But then the thing is that these legacy wastes, these are the old waste and they've been aged and so they have some pr properties like that. So can you actually take that and make it into, make it go away, in a, essentially? Right. So, and so then the question, how do you make it go away? The only way you can make this go away is by doing uh, close to 100% recycling. Hmm. 
So that was the objective. So then the question becomes, how do you separate the different fractions? And, you know, and, and you know, there's a proper way to do that. Uh, not only that, uh, the scale of the operation is important too. So suppose you're talking about small cities, small villages, uh, bigger cities, medium-sized cities, et cetera. I'm talking about in the Indian context. Uh, you could actually, you will find different sizes of uh, these landfills operation, landfill operations. And so the type of uh, the uh, recycling operations and the type of reuse yeah. is going to be quite different. So, you know, in, in that paper, we there are several references to the various way, fractions in which you can convert them. And then we said, well, you know, there's there's also this issue of this plastic waste. And, and, by the, and at that time last year, the whole issue of this plastic, uh, uh, you know, the regulation on plastic, the policy on plastics was evolving in India. And mm-hmm. I didn't go there thinking I'll get involved with something like that, but it was, I did get involved with that. Uh, uh, and we had had these uh, different conferences and, uh, and workshops in different places and meetings with different government officials too. Yeah. And that policy is still evolving. It's getting close to it. But the, but the idea is that how do you not use plastic? I mean, you can't just tell people don't use plastic and not give them an alternative. So you have to do something with that. Right. But in the context of legacy wastes, there are things that, for example, don't degrade, don't biodegrade. And these might be plastics, other types of materials too. So in that case, after you exhaust all the resource, all the ways in which you deal with it, one of the ways you can do, do one, one thing you could do is to uh, incinerate them uh, incineration is really the very last option mm. that I would consider, but the objective there is to produce some energy out of it. So you know, yeah. that would be something like that. So after you take out everything else, you know that would be the way. So legacy wastes are a, are a huge problem in India, and you know they're starting to tackle it in different places. I actually visited some of those landfills last year as well. Um, you know the objective again is to remove all the legacy waste so that you create a site and part of that site can actually be used to uh, design an engineered landfill of some type. And once you do that, then, you, uh, then you're then you okay. In 2011, uh, when, I, when I was there, we gave a series of workshops to uh, the pollution control boards, the state pollution control boards. We had groups of uh, you know officers and engineers come from different places. These are policy makers mm-hmm. on hazardous waste management. And during that, you know, my interaction with them, I learned that at that time they were looking more in the hazardous waste, but they were really not even looking at the municipal waste problem. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that has changed since then. The last time I went, they are slowly looking at that a little bit more in terms of having engineered landfills, because that's the only way to do it. Landfills are really something that, you know, you, you I won't recommend for, as a f- first uh, first. Uh, thing, but those are things that we have to deal with, and, and uh, you know, eventually, because you will necessarily produce something, because that's the nature of uh, how thermodynamics works. Right. Yeah. So some of the sites, as you say, is uh, is fully packed, so you can't really use them anymore. Uh, but when you recycle, put in some process for recycling, um, are there ways to uh, get energy from it? Um, are there technologies that could be put into use? Yeah, there are a lot of tech. See, one thing you can, uh, from a thermodynamic standpoint, yeah, the less you burn or the less you convert something into something which is more oxidized, the better off you are because it's already in a higher energy state. So if we can do the recycling, uh, first of all, the source reduction, if we can cut down the waste re- production, that would be great. Now that's not such a big problem in India because, but the population is high and the and the magnitude of things is high. So, for example, in the case of the legacy uh, uh, waste, if you are able to uh, take some of that material and then directly recycle the organic fr- fraction and make compost out of it, now you have produced something which is of value. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then you take some of the the solid waste and then you, for example, you have uh, you may have construction and demolition debris. Which is really a, a a really horrible waste of space in in any place, including in a landfill. Uh, so if you're able to take that and then try to make something out of it and and use it on a construction site, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. There are many materials which you can actually do a little bit of processing and make, say, different bricks with it. And so those bricks and those types of building materials, they may not have the same strength as say concrete or something like that, but 
at the same time, you can use them for certain applications. So f- f- such as, you know, maybe retaining walls or, you know, some kind of uh, uh, you yeah. know, uh, operation. So th- that would be the preferred way. But then ultimately, when if you're left with something that you can't do anything with, then those are the ones that you may have to incinerate. And even though incineration is uh, c- considered to be a bad word, uh, as a as an engineer, you you really can't you, you really can't rule out all the possibilities. Mm-hmm. Another area I just want to shift gears. Uh, another area that you've been working on is the removal of nutrients from wastewater. Right. And when you have a lot of nutrients in the wastewater, I guess there are issues like uh, algae and plant growth and um, dissolved oxygen issues. So th- these are things like phosphorus and nitrogen. Exactly. Those are like, those are the two big ones. Yeah. That, okay. That's pretty much it. Yeah. So, so how do you? So there are, I guess, there are chemical ways to remove them, biological ways to remove them. So, what is the state of the art for something like that? Yeah, I, I work with uh, one of our local uh, wastewater treatment plants very closely. I, most of my work is quite practical, uh, or you know, applied. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, um, so a few years ago, I had a student who was working with them as an intern, and there are different ways, like you said, before I go into those details. You know, there are, like you said, there are chemical precipitation methods. Those are quick, but those are a little bit more expensive. And then you have to deal with the waste one way or the other. Sometimes that may be the best option. So you can't rule out any option. Uh, yeah. But if you use the biological approach, which is uh, used by a lot of people uh, uh, or and actually pushed a lot by people. And my uh, background also is biological treatment. So uh, I have to acknowledge that bias but at the same time you know one of the things that uh, you, you can certainly use uh, biological means uh, and you can um, change the the type of uh, microorganisms that you have in your uh, in the wastewater treatment plant through a mix of um, you know different technology different strategies by changing yeah. different conditions the, uh, the how much oxygen there is etc so the local wastewater treatment plant here that's called the greater Peoria sanity district it's, uh, it's, it's one of the more, uh, I would say, um, a progressive type of uh, uh, wastewater treatment plants. And going back to the 1950s and 60s, when they came up with a new process called the croissoning process, that was the first time that anybody was uh, had uh, was dealing with you know, issues of nitrogen, et cetera. Uh, but then, you know, more recently, just in the last uh, maybe three, four years, they put in a process called the enhanced bio- biological phosphorus removal. And I've seen yeah. this process right from the beginning to the end in terms of the construction of what they did, what changes they made. So, uh, you know, the principle simply is that, uh, uh, so if you control the phosphorus and if you control the nitrogen, mm-hmm. oh, then the, prob- the what will happen is that when the discharge happens, the discharge will actually uh, r- uh, into the rivers the, ri- the rivers are not going to be laden with these chemicals and then eventually if you if, if you if you if you live in this part of the country in the midwest uh you know for example illinois river runs through peoria so the yeah. illinois river drains into the mississippi river and so do so many other rivers and the mississippi is pretty big eventually it drains into the into the gulf of mexico and yeah. if you look at the gulf of mexico that's you have a dead zone and that dead zone is mainly because of the nitrogen and phosphorus excessive growth of algae like you said but then when they die off is when the problem begins because then it becomes bod sucks out all the oxygen and then it wipes out the economics of the economy because now the fishermen don't get their food etc you know or the other place to uh, or or their uh, crop of fish to sell etc so it it destroys the commerce in that sense not to mention all the beaches etc so uh, if you control the problem at the source, which means you know you at least you're dealing with it in the wastewater treatment plants, you're controlling part of the problem. The bigger problem, which is more difficult to deal with, with nitrogen and phosphorus, is really the farmland, and there's no easy way to do that. So the only way to do that is by you know uh, things like what they call phytoremediation, using plants mm-hmm. and using buffer strips uh, along the way to kind of uh, remove those types of chemicals. Uh, because they are very effective. Plants are very effective. I mean, that's what they do. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the time, if but, but it's not being practiced uh, uniformly in all the states in this country. And you can understand that, that the farmers who are, who are uh, uh, you know, dealing with that, they want to maximize their crop. And so they may, you know, do the do farming till the edge of the river, which is really not a good idea. 
So, yeah. you know, it's a process of education and uh, it's been happening for some time now. There's some states are more advanced than others in terms of how they've implemented that solution. But not so the, the biological processes, um, are they using some sort of microorganisms for that or how does it work? Yeah, biological pro- processes, we can say if you're talking about if you talk to anybody in the field, biological processes typically refers to microorganisms like typically bacteria is really what they're talking about. Okay. But, okay. but biological processes can also include plants. In that case, it would be called phytoremediation. Oh, Phyto okay. meaning the P-H-Y-T-O is, stands for plants. So yeah. uh, in a broader sense, you know, you can include both of them. Okay. Yeah, another area that you have a lot of interest in been uh, doing work in is the mathematical modeling of environmental systems. And this is you know, uh, looks like a very complex problem. Um, there are a lot of decision makers, a lot of different planners, and a lot of different issues to consider, right? Social, economic, technical, legislation, institutional, and political issues. So um, what is, when you model these things, you know, um, I'm, I'm coming from the corporate world where decisions need to consider a lot of uncertainty around, um, around all, all types of factors. Um, how do you consider uncertainty around policy choices when you think about these things? Yeah, most of my modeling work, especially with environmental systems, has uh, been on the science side. Okay. But there also there's a huge amount of uh, uncertainty. And yeah. uh, because each of, I mean, if you look at it in terms of how much, uh, suppose I have to look at uh, the rate, you know, five different rates and, you know, 10 different processes. There ends up being so many different uh, simultaneous differential equations here to solve and all that <laughs> kind of good stuff. Yeah. But, and then not only that, each of those equations is now, you know, some of them are stiff equations because of the rates and all that kind of stuff. And then there is the issue of actually the uncertainty within each of those parameters. How accurate is these, the, the stuff? So then, you know, as engineers, you know, we typically talk about things like safety factors. <laughs> right. but, you know, we say, okay, we'll apply a safety factor so to account for all these in- uncertainties. But then the, pr- the problem of uncertainty still remains. And unless somebody does a proper sensitivity analysis and uncertainty analysis on that, you, can, you, you won't know what safety factor to apply. We have a general idea about that. When it comes to policy making, I mean, that's part of also some of the classes I teach. Um, uh, modeling policy is inherently much more complex because there you're you you're dealing with uh, people and there you're also dealing with policies each and and there's much more variability in that than in any you know for example a, a scientific process or something that is happening in nature uh, because right. there you know as soon as you involve uh, decision making and in both cases there's decision making. Yeah. So, you know, for example, why am I doing this modeling? And I mean, to have fun? Yeah, okay, but that's not, <laughs> that's not going to pay the bill or that's not going to help anybody in the long run. So that I'm doing that modeling so that I can tell the decision maker, do this, don't do that. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, so in uh, one of the projects, I was in uh, New York for a couple of years before I moved to, uh, um, to Peoria. And yeah. uh, at that time, you know, I, we had this project uh, on the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. It's called, there are two ponds, two freshwater ponds. One mm-hmm. is called the East Pond and the West Pond, right? So, uh, and they, they are freshwater ponds. They were created back in the 1940s by an act from, uh, uh, I think, Mayor LaGuardia at that time. Uh, so basically, these two ponds, they were, uh, they were undergoing various kinds of uh, issues going back to the 80s and then I they asked me to look at it in the in the late 1990s so I did right. that and then I did some of that work there and then I brought some of it back here to to Peoria we did some modeling work on that so when we did this analysis so the, so the question so the uh, you know the people on the ground there they said well should we uh, should we in, should we invest in something like a um, you know an aeration system or or should we not invest in a yeah. And that was the question that they had, because that costs money, uh, not right. only capital costs, but the, you know, the operating costs are very high for that. So somebody had, they, had, they wanted to ma- have some sound sense to make that decision. So we did a lot of different scenarios and ran it. And what we found was that if you, if they actually instituted that solution of putting in the aeration, even though it sounds really 
nice and wonderful to put oxygen and air into the water, uh, it would be detrimental because mm. it would stir up the sediment so much and that and the amount of BOD which was in there was so high mm. that uh, you know it would it would actually kill some of those those for a long time. And so, you know, I think what we eventually came up with after the, well, that's what our modeling told us. And so then we went, uh, we, we looked at it from a management standpoint. And then we said, you know, from a decision making standpoint, the better option for them is not to invest in the new technology, but rather to use their existing technology and manage how they are, um, you know, have some kind of protective barriers, et cetera. So from a from a that standpoint you know that was the decision that they they came so that was a science based or a evidence based uh, decision that helped them to you know create their own policy and then they may have used it elsewhere so the same thing happened in lake alsur and also there's another lake in uh, in rajasthan that i i did, had some work, but mostly the lake alsur also uh, this which is in bangalore by the way in yeah. india uh, that 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 was also something like that yeah, the, from a policy perspective, I guess there are multiple issues, right? One is the horizon problem for the decision maker. Uh, if the decision maker, if the politician is involved in a decision making process, he or she is trying to get elected. Uh, that is a horizon that they need to need to optimize. Uh, and the other thing is the externalization of costs. So when we think about costs, we are typically not thinking about societal costs, right? So you know, going back to the India case study, um, it is uh, the the entire cost on the system, such as uh, diseases that emerge from uh, lack of uh, good water, um, you know, all sorts of issues downstream that is not going to, it's going to show up in the long run. Uh, we don't really have a process uh, for the environment, right, to, to make decisions that takes into account all possible costs. And uh, we will end up always sub-optimizing decisions. Yeah, and, and that, that's a—I uh, mean—that's a very complex thing. And you know, we have in, in the area of sustainability, we have some uh, work that's been done by uh, by different scientists, especially in University of South Florida. And uh, I, you know, for example, you know, it's a different way of thinking. It's a systems thinking. Yeah. And you, you probably use that a lot in the corporate world as well. Yeah. But, the, but the, the, you know, with the systems thinking, you have to think about all the inputs and outputs. So you can do that. You can quantify some of these things. But when it comes to, uh, I don't really, I can't, I can't really blame the politicians because, I mean, they want to get elected, you know, so, okay. <laughs> You know, it's a reality. That's yeah. that's what it is. It doesn't matter which party they are and all that stuff. But most, whenever it comes to any environmental issues, etc., it's mostly local. So that that way, you know, we can uh, that that drives the policy also. But uh, the, but like what you said, the um, uh, you know when you look at a uh, the uh, policy making process itself, especially when you're looking at the environmental side of it. You have uh, so many entities involved, and it, you have to look at it also from whether it's at the federal level, whether it's at the state level, or the local level. Yeah. Uh, so we have a lot of stakeholders, you know. Mm. So when we have these stakeholders, uh, you know, such as the people regulators like EPA, etc., and uh, you know, typically I, I have some friends in the uh, in the industry, and uh, you know, sometimes they tell me how, all the different things that happen. So typically, you know, when when it, when a when a policy comes out, it's published in this register, federal register. It comes out, and then, you know, um, uh, and then it it may be challenged. The people look at it very carefully and see if if their industry is challenged, etc. And then they may approach their their politicians, etc., change it, and and that's a continuous process, uh, you know, process that happens after a few cycles and all of those hearings eventually it gets published and becomes maybe some kind of a regulation so we are looking at something starting as a law going into the regular into the policy being yeah. in, and then eventually into the, the unless it comes to the regulation it's not going to really mean much because the policy may be something but the regulation is where you can say that the uh uh, you, you, you cannot do something bad. <laughs> you know, so unless the regulation is there, yeah. that's where the, uh, I guess, the rubber meets the road type of thing. You know, that's where the real thing happens. So 
policy has to be evidence based that is the number one thing that we want to think about yeah. uh, or or have in mind the second thing is that uh, you know the you have to consider the realities of the politics and uh, you know uh, uh, which are there but uh, that has to take a secondary place to what we are looking at so i mean and that is also a problem in a, in any society in any country in uh, today's uh, world but you know we, we have to take the long term view and we are always used to taking the short term view because you know some somebody's in uh, worried about their election or some company is worried about their next quarter earnings etc it's always like that so but the people who look at the long term um uh, uh, you know uh, goal whether it happens to be in a company or whether it happens to be in a larger economic uh, environmental issue like this those are the people who come out ahead because they are well prepared for uh, you know dealing with those eventualities but it requires a certain vision and it requires yeah. that uh, you know the the systems thinking to get there yeah yeah now i want to talk about something completely different uh, krishna so this is um, you've been working with a non profit organization uh, i believe it's founded by uh, dr madhu vishwanathan uh, one of your colleagues and it's called marketplace literacy yeah. and this is in india right yeah it started in india so i one of the things i found in life is that uh, i i have some very fantastic friends <laughs> and i choose to uh, and these are the people also that i love to work with uh, in different capacities so madhu vishwanathan is also one of them uh, uh, madhu vishwanathan actually was uh, a classmate of mine um in uh, in uh, well well we were both uh, in iit madras yeah yeah uh, and you may remember him also i'm not sure but uh, he uh, he's uh, he's uh, um he's he was a, he's a professor he's a, he's now moved to loyola in uh, california after retiring from uh, from uh, university of illinois champaign after almost 30 years Yeah. he was where he was uh, he was uh, working in the area of subsistence marketing and he had this vision to found this organization called marketplace literacy and the idea was that uh, we wanted uh, the uh, the goal was to empower people with knowledge and uh, at a very uh, small scale and you know when you empower people with the, with knowledge and how to do certain things especially in terms of how to run a business how to um how to create a small business etc and yeah. you are talking about cottages <laughs> you know those those kind that level and and villages and this time when i went to india i had a chance to go and visit some of the villages and i had a lot of discussion some discussions with the, with with the people in wall and even in my broken tamil uh, you know because i had forgotten it uh, from the time i had uh, lived in uh, in chennai uh, mm-hmm. we, we it was a really eye opening experience in terms of how they are able to use uh, the principles of marketing and how yeah. they're able to adapt that to actually creating small extremely small businesses mm. with a very very small uh, you know profit margin but they still are able to do it now it's especially important in some of the villages and uh, and it was important in south india that's where it started in and mostly in, in tamil nadu and then it grew into other other states as well but uh, the 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 problem was that the it was uh, the the women in in many of these uh, villages they were uh, they were they they really had uh, a lack of uh, resources in other words they didn't have money to run their uh, their household also so so for so for, for people like them they, this was like a boon so they 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 would actually show up in larger numbers and there's a team that uh, madhu built over a period of time it took a lot of hard work a lot, a lot of his own money and uh, you know along the way uh, we helped in different ways but he built a huge team uh, and it became a big success there and right now it's actually going on uh, actively there in india but it also has gone uh, now there are, and then he, uh, later on he was uh, he became active in africa yeah. kenya and other places and then also in south america so now you know the whole organization is uh, is in about 13 different countries and uh, it's all you know it's amazing thing is that it's mostly volunteer driven and um, and and part of the reason why this works is just like the case of that uh, the the indian example with uh, buying having the buy in from the pe- local people in terms of 
it's them seeing the value in, for example, treating the water for economic benefit or their farming or to create, say, fish, et cetera. So the same way uh, or, uh, to grow fish and then have a economy sub- uh, which uh, supported that. Yeah. The same idea was here that they, they saw the, uh, the impact of this, how that could change it. And so even though the focus of this is educational, you know, the, uh, the way that it spread and it impacted people is quite a lot. So uh, that is a very, very beautiful project that. Uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah. It, it sounds sounds really exciting, Krishna. So, you know, um, two things. There was a uh, there was a big push toward microfinancing, right, uh, which is you don't need a lot of money to get somebody self-sustaining. Um, you know, you t- it takes very little money, but they have to have access uh, at the right time. And uh, this is uh, sort of which is, there is some basic uh, literacy experience, expertise uh, needed uh, to, to set something up and make it self-sustaining. And if you can provide these two aspects, right, uh, the, the micro expertise, just call it, and micro financing, then you can actually create a, a very self-sustaining system uh, with people doing their own, uh, applying their own energy to the problem. No, you, you, you're absolutely right with that. So, you know, the, the financing part is that you can say microfinancing, you know, that would be a very effective way, but yeah, this this marketplace literacy is more on the literacy side. Okay. You know, we said that that was on the, you know, there are two aspects to it. One is to gain access to the money, which is one thing. And because, I mean, then you need to be a bank or you need to have relationships. But here it was more in terms of educating the people in terms of uh, uh, teaching them what works, what doesn't work, not coming in and telling them what to do, yeah. but actually looking at what the situation is and then adapting that, adapting the principles to of subsistence marketplace to actually, you know, make it work for them. And, you know, it is amazing that when I went and met some of these women, and it was amazing that, I mean, I, when I went there, most of the people, they were women. <laughs> you know, you had groups of, uh, and it is so nice to see that because, you know, many of them told me that, we had some meetings also in the in the in uh, in Chennai and also in the in the rural areas. But we we one of the things that stuck with me was how empowered they felt mm-hmm. by just having enough money so that they didn't have to ask their mother-in-law or father-in-law or their husband that they could do something on their own, and for somebody to feel independent and have that freedom. It is just, you know, priceless. So, yeah. you know, that's really a, a fantastic thing, you know, in terms of, uh, say, the contribution of this. But, and and remember, since it's a small enough, uh, um, you know, operation, not operation in terms of the, uh, uh, the number of people involved, but in terms of how much work they needed to do, but they needed to do things. They needed to learn things. They needed to go in a methodical way. So there were workshops organized. And this was not, a, not just once in a, you know, one here and one there. It was a systematic process where they, they, the, the, the team on the ground would meet with them, get them going, give them all the tools. And they would work through all the difficulties that they had financially and also from a family standpoint that they may sometimes you know, when they go, when you're looking at villages, they may not be able to attend all the all the meetings because of various types of um, you know social issues and also what might be happening at home, etc. Right. But in spite of that, you know, the it took root, and it was so rewarding to actually see so many uh, women, uh, and you you have young people, you have older people, and they just had nothing but gratitude for this program, which actually empowered them with education with knowledge mm, so that's yeah. why you know i think in india we have such a high regard for knowledge that uh, you know that just tells you that th- this this really works i mean you teach somebody something which stays with them yeah yeah so in conclusion krishna so if you go back to you know sort of the environment degradation uh, related to waste um, we can see that problem not only in developing countries but all around the world 
and you have done a lot of work in this area uh, so you look forward five five years let's say uh, where do you think uh, we will be uh, are things improving um, or are we you know going down a path that uh, we can really turn back from yeah i'm i'm an optimist yeah <laughs> so i mean uh, i i can see the good you know but uh, it would be foolish to not recognize that you know we are faced with pretty big challenges now i just talked about water right but there are other issues that we are dealing with um you know things like uh, how the climate is changing etc these are huge major problems and um you know the interesting and a good thing is that we have it in our own power to to change the way that that we we do things and the quicker we do them or the quicker we realize them and actually know in our hearts that that's the right thing to do yeah the faster will be the change that will be needed so that you know we can pass it on to our the generations that come around us you know there's a very famous uh, quotation that uh, you know we don't borrow we don't inherit the earth but we really borrow it from our future Absolutely. generations yeah so this, yeah. Is, this is the if, i mean it's a question of you know having that type of an attitude and you know one of my teachers uh, one of my spiritual teachers he says very beautifully that we are everybody is born a consumer in the sense that when you grow up as soon as you're born you need something you need something you need something but then <laughs> yeah when you when you start to become a contributor you change from being a consumer to being a contributor mm-hmm. you become a blessing to the world and i think it's in the it's an everybody everybody has that power to right. actually become a contributor <laughs> Yeah yeah that's a that's a great way to think about it. Uh Krishna this has been uh, great it has been uh, great to catch up after 35 years. <laughs> yeah and, I can't uh, believe it. Yeah, yeah thanks for spending uh, time with me and uh, good luck with uh, everything that you're doing in this area. It's wonderful to talk to you Gail and uh, hope to you know talk to you again soon and um, I know you're on the somewhere on the east coast at this moment or I am yeah Yeah, okay. in New York area. Yeah. Yeah. So, what am I? Yeah. So, hopefully we'll 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 be able to connect pretty soon. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.